here has been to the Microtox before? Awesome. If you haven't, brace yourself. You are in for something a little bit different than the normal GDC talk, where we have 10 speakers who are going to speak over the next hour, and they each have very specific guidelines. They each get 20 slides that play for 16 seconds apiece, no more and no less. They are set on a timer. It is very emotionally intense <laughs> to be up here. Um, and uh, it's always under one overarching theme, which this year is creative voice. And I'm joined by the amazing Mike Jungbluth, who's going to kick it off. Yeah, All right, here we go. Hi, I'm Mike Jungluth, a lead gameplay animator at BioWare, and I'm creator of the Animation Bootcamp and the Animation Exchange. So for the next six minutes, it makes perfect sense for me to talk about the benefits of supporting a creative voice, both your own and others. The core of what we do as animators, technical animators and animation programmers is support other people's voices and help bring them to life. This goes for both our teammates and the characters in our games, and that support as well is just so Tiring? <laughs> I mean, when you've made so many similar combat and locomotion systems from game to game that it feels like Groundhog Day, summoning the strength to get excited about another mashup of other proven game systems and power fantasies can just get harder and harder. So, if I'm being honest here, more than some altruistic idea of supporting other people's creative voices, this is really about what are we doing with ours? We all hit a point where we sort of say, what the hell am I really doing with my animation and these characters that I'm helping to bring to life? Do I want to work on giant games with giant teams or do I want to work on a smaller team and go the indie route? After all these years figuring out the skills I need for the type of work I do now, can I even scale that up or out as needed for the other type of work? And who the hell do I think I am that I could even say anything that anyone would care about to begin with? Okay, uh, imposter syndrome. Uh, syndrome, what should I do? Uh, I could go skydiving to feel a little alive. Um, there we go. <laughs> That's the sweet adrenaline boost that I needed. Maybe that can masquerade as confidence for my remaining four minutes. Four minutes. What have I been talking about for the last two minutes? All right, let's, uh, let's check my notes. Uh, okay. Uh, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't help. What? Fuck. Uh, okay, support. Uh, supporting a creative voice. Right. Look at that bastard faking confidence on slide one. Ugh. Fake it till you make it, right? Uh, we could easily waste our next three minutes on if you ever stop feeling like a fake or if you can ever really make it and the very feeling of making it leading to the tedium that got us here. But let's look at the space between fake it and make it. Knowledge and expertise are the bridge, it, uh, the bridge over the fake it to make it gap. They're the reason we're all here. They're why the, bu the boot camp and the exchange exist. The more you learn about a subject, the less of a fake you are. And the more you can share how you made it, well, the better it is for everyone. But that's really been largely focused on the how of the craft. And while the how remains important, the what you're saying and why you're saying it of our craft now needs a lot more focus. Otherwise, we've really just built a bridge to nowhere. Or worse, an unwelcoming forest. Because the knowledge and expertise we needed to get here is often separate from the expertise required to pass through. We need to become versed in sociology, psychology, philosophy, economics, anthropology, archaeology, a whole bunch more ologies. Sure, you don't need to know what all of these things are to share your hot take on the what and why, but we as creators should strive to engage with everything in life to the degree we do our animations. It can be your torch as you venture into that unwelcoming forest. But if creativity is the spark that lights your torch, knowledge of the subject is going to be the fuel that will keep it lit. And like water to a flame, Lack of knowledge will actually weaken your torch until it's eventually extinguished, leaving you in the dark, alone. And relighting an extinguished light is even harder than lighting a new one. The amount of knowledge to cover the doubt you and others will have about your ideas and approaches will make even the brightest of creative sparks feel dull and, well, lifeless. So we need to make the forest less of that and more of this to help the people crossing the bridge of how not succumb to instant burnout and cynicism. Because like the bridge we built and maintain, we now have a lot of forest paths to light, which isn't gonna be easy. So when you see people speaking about the what and why, even if all you want is the how, listen, it can matter someday. 
If you're thinking this isn't an animation talk, well, I see you, but my remaining minute can't be the end of this conversation. We all need to be open and honest about what we know and what we don't know. When you have a source of knowledge, share it. When you don't, listen. Then we can all know how much fuel we have and where to fuel up when any of us need it. We need to then know our platforms that we engage with, social media, conferences, our games. They allow us to engage with different amounts of immediacy, agency, and directness, which can multiply the intensity of your light. And each is gonna require different amounts of fuel. Because the what and why are less objective than the how. So we need to be better at balancing our engagement with what we and others make. Take care not to burn out your own torch or to burn down another's path when trying to light the way. My hope is that this week we have a lot more what and why conversations on our path through the forest. Because in the forest is a new world full of inspiring and unique creations, pushing all of us to know more about the craft and ourselves, but also each other by honestly supporting each other's voice. Thank you. Our work is never finished, only abandoned, or how to ship unfinished animation and feel good about it. <laughs> Hi, my name's Kristen. I'm an animator and I've been in the industry for almost 10 years. In my career, I've shipped over 16 titles and have been credited on probably more than 20. Doing the math, that's almost two games a year, or more than that if you take everything into consideration. Yeah, that's a lot of projects. This isn't a brag, I bring it up because it means I've dealt with some very tight deadlines, and when you don't have enough time or resources, you have to find ways to ship unfinished animation and feel good about it. Shipping unfinished animation? That sounds kind of embarrassing. Sometimes, no matter how much time and energy you put into something, it's not going to be good just because video games. It's up to you to dig into your creative toolbox and tackle all the problems, expected and unexpected, that are thrown at you. You know, there's the age-old problems. Perhaps game design isn't locked down. Perhaps some big opportunity arose and you have to ship early. Or perhaps you just never even had enough time to begin with. And then there's the weirder problems. Perhaps all your animations are sped up to batch the, match the beat of a song out of your control, or your animations are shared across totally wildly different characters, or you can animate your character's body, but their heads are controlled by a avatared VR headset. All real things I've had to deal with. And no matter how normal or weird your problems are, things happen, you just have to get it done. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you should death march cr crunch your way through it, and don't just give up and half-ass it, work smart not just hard. And real talk, focus on what's important and work on the extras if you have time. Don't sacrifice your friends and family crunching on something that no one's gonna notice but you. Because players are not going to care that you stayed late to put that subtle offset in your character's fingers. And that's who we're making these games for, the players. On one game I worked on, I decided it was better to add animation variety than to polish a few animations to a perfect polish. I wanted the player to be delighted and surprised when their character did something fun and unexpected. Always remember who your game is for. And yes, that means for that game, I didn't end up with many demo reel pieces, but that doesn't mean the animation was bad. It accomplished what it needed to for the situation and the players enjoyed it. You're making a game, not a demo reel. And that's the point. Really think about what's right for the situation. Sometimes a small set of hyper-polished animation is what you need or maybe variety is key, and sometimes things are just a mess and you have to be flexible. And once you have decided on your direction, try to get animations in the game quickly. Test them, throw them out, and make new ones. This is especially true when the design is constantly changing. And don't spend time polishing something until you know things are working as a whole. Once everything is roughed in and working, make a polish priority list. Take the time to identify what animation is most important, even uh, and hit polish for them first, even if they aren't your favorites. Don't get caught up in the little details and ignore the big picture. And the next thing to do is to work in passes. It gives you some leeway when your team pulls the rug out from under you. If you haven't focused on polishing animations one at a time, you won't lose as much work if someone cuts something or changes the design. 
You'll also know that everything is at the same even level of polish. As a whole, it will be cohesive. And use the tools you have. For example, use key pairs instead of stepped animation. In an emergency, you can ship a blocked out splined animation, but you can't ship a skipped one. You can also use animation layers and state graph to create new animations quickly. And speaking of state graphs, use them. Being able to set up and integrate your own animations is so powerful and allows you to get your things in the game faster and test them yourself. Waiting on engineering to integrate animations is frustrating and often just bottlenecks the process. And about engineers, bug them for tools to help you. If you have an idea for a tool that will save you time, then talk to your lead or talk to engineering directly if you can. Often something that will take them an hour will save you days worth of frustration. Your time is important too, so work with your team to make your job easier. And speaking of your team, when somebody comes at you with an unrealistic request that'll blow out your schedule, push back. You're a team member too, <laughs> and your time and opinion is important. Offer solutions and find a middle ground that's appropriate for your timeline and your team size. And if you know you have a difficult task before you, don't panic. Make a realistic plan and execute. Go in with a clear creative vision and identify, prioritize, and focus on what's most meaningful for the game and the player. If you've achieved that, then that's a success, even if you're shipping with some unpolished animation. And as a final note, put in your best effort, but not being able to finish things to a perfect polish is not a reflection on you as a person. A lot of the time, that unfinished animation is only imperfect to you. To everyone else, the animation is finished. And remember, you can always go back and polish your favorite animations for your demo reel later. Thanks, everyone. I'm Kristen, and you can find me at, at Stuff by Kristen on Twitter. Hi, everybody. My name is Yusef Cole, and I'm from the Bronx, New York. And uh, this is the homepage of my website. There's a reason that it looks like a bad choose your own adventure game. It's because it, I claim very two different lines of work as my profession. Oh, God. Hold on a second. <laughs> it just broke. Let's try that again. I am a motion graphics animator, and I specialize in software like Adobe After Effects and Cinema 4D. I animate shapes and typography for 2D screens, and I've been doing that for over a decade. I've worked on projects for companies like Facebook, Nike, and so on. And I'm also a freelance games critic. I write essays about video games where I try and dig into unexplored themes and how they reflect uh, politics and history in the world. I've written for sites like Waypoint, Pace, Unwinnable, and Zam, which brings me to what I'm going to talk about today, picking passions. <laughs> for years, I've done motion graphics as my main gig and picked up freelance writing on the side. Why? Because as interesting as the process of animation can be, a lot of the jobs I've taken haven't been that intellectually stimulating. There's a lot of creative potential in motion graphics, but the content is usually a little hard to care about. Snowflakes for a car commercial, uh, animating cute mascots for health insurance companies, helping a social media network apologize for being shitty before they then go on to be even more shitty. <laughs> so in August, I started working as the head of animation at Patriot Act with Assam Minaj. And this is a show, uh, it's the first time in, in many years that I felt truly invested in the end product and the content I'm making. I get to work with fun, brilliant people coming up with fascinating topics that I actually care about. And uh, this presents a problem for my side hustle, writing. On the, many of my previous gigs, I was able to take weeks off for research, brainstorming, and pitching. Now my time is super compressed. We make an episode a week uh, from the start. So I can't give this job just 75%. But I still love to write, so I've spent the past few months wrestling with how exactly to do that. That means squeezing in my passion projects where I can, like on the train before work, writing at night before passing out, waking up early to write, never going to the gym ever. <laughs> of course, there are some limitations to these methods, trying to finish an essay on my phone in the middle of rush hour, not getting to spend time with my partner or my cats after work, being perpetually sleep deprived, never going to the gym ever. <laughs> Um, there's there's got to be a better way. A lot of the friction comes from trying to do two totally different things at once. It's really hard sometimes to switch gears in the brain, especially when one of those gears is huge and overwhelming and sucks up all of your time. Uh, here's how I attempt to invest both in writing unique, challenging essays and engaging more fully in the creative process of the show. 
If I remember to turn off my animator brain and to turn on my writer brain, I can apply the ideas we came up with, we come up with the show as inspiration for my own work in the future. So I think Karl Marx may have been onto something when he told workers to seize the means of production. What I mean in my case is how do you take something that doesn't belong to you, your labor and your time on a job, and make it work for your own interests? So um, some background, I enjoy writing about culture and politics and how they intersect with games. Um, some examples are for Unwinnable, I wrote about uh, Cuphead and the racism of the 1930s cartoons that inspired it. I was able to dig into the history of minstrelsy and American uh, entertainment for, for this essay. For Waypoint, I wrote about Detroit Become Human and I talked about the game's questionable analogy between race, labor, and fictional androids. I also talked about how the studio itself, Quantic Dream, is also plagued by labor issues and how that knowledge infects the messages trying to get across. So both of these essays were deep historical dives which required a lot of time spent on research. And I don't really have that time anymore. <laughs> Patriot Act is all, but luckily Patriot Act is a show about historical deep dives though. So the solution to my lack of time then is to allow my main hustle to work for my side one. Here are four of the episodes, um, some of the episodes that we've done so far on the show. One is about student loans, one's on Amazon, Supreme, and Saudi Arabia. Without spending too much extra time, I can generate some really interesting pitches off of each of these subjects. Is it worth going to school for esports for student loans? Uh, how scarcity culture affects the value of rare old games for Supreme? What Amazon's history of cannibalizing its, own, its competitors means for its game publisher and games in the Arab world and youth culture in modern Saudi Arabia? I haven't written any of these yet, so <laughs> you guys are free to pick. One of the most important practices of a games critic is looking outside of games for inspiration. Rather than seeing my day job as a slog, something that doesn't apply at all to writing, I now see it as a creative goldmine with plenty of excess ideas and energy spilling out. I'm daily inspired by being on a creative job that thankfully seems to have a lot of parallels with my side hustle. Uh, but the kind of job you have shouldn't matter. The key is finding the right similarities and learning how to make wildly different disciplines inform each other. The result can be something greater than some of its parts. Am I still tired? Yes. Time will never be on my side. I still have to write in the mornings and on the train and on the weekends. But it's something I love to do and I will always love doing. So I'm, gonna, I'm glad that I found a way to not only make it work with my day job, but to make my day job work for it. Thank you. Hello, world. Um, so I am Heather Alexandra McIntyre. I am a staff writer for Kotaku.com, a video game website about video games. And I have never made a PowerPoint since high school. So here we go. Um, so uh, we're talking about creative voice today. And sometimes that means looking at games from perspectives that we might not have considered them before. So I want to kind of go through what that might look like for a very specific thing in this case. In this case, it's idle animations. I'm just going to start with what's basically my thesis once the slide moves forward. But the idea is that even the smallest things inside games that we love um, have really, really strange and large implications that um, we need to examine. Lana, is this slide not moving? <laughs> I told you at the start of what I was talking about. Is it moving? There we go. So what's the big deal here? So I'm gonna talk about idle animation, so let's go. So the goals of players and the goals of fictional characters often align, but there are times when players exert control over actors and subvert their wants or desires. Idle animations are places where they're free from player tyranny. We will get into that. And you should treat them as these very special places. So uh, video game characters are many different things at once. This is Sora from Kingdom Hearts on the left. He's in gameplay on the right, he's in a cutscene. Um, video game characters exist between very specific dipole states. They're being tugged between two things um, at any given point, and we should define what those things are. They are both actors, by which I mean that they are controllable persona manipulated by players, and they're characters, by which I mean individuals within a fiction, but also like people in a world, and we need to start treating them like actual people. Um, because they're being pulled in these two different directions, there's conflict though. Um, what Raiden wants as a character in Metal Gear Solid 2 is incredibly different than what a player might want for Raiden. 
at any given time. Um, and because video game characters are fulfilling two roles, it's a problem. Here's an example of that. On the left, there is a YouTuber who is making a compilation video of all the death animations in Resident Evil 2. The objective here for the actor is to die over and over. Claire Redfield's objective as a character is to live. These two things are not compatible. That's super screwed up. But good news, these two things can align. Solid Snake wants to sneak through a base and he wants to complete his mission. The player wants to not get spotted and get the highest rank at the end of the game. Great, things are in alignment, but we need to be careful because players are tyrants. Um, I know we're supposed to say like players are the best and everything, but players scare the shit out of me. They control everything about video game worlds. They can make these people, and I mean it, these people do things that they do not want to do. Um, the implications of that are very scary. I think video game characters want freedom, and thankfully there are places where they get it. Thankfully, yes. Um, cutscenes is one place where they actually get to act as like entities solely within their fictional world, by which I mean they just get to be people, and then idle animations where they finally get to express just for a moment, a little autonomy. This is Sonic the Hedgehog. This is very well-known idle animation. This thing expresses a very specific tension. Um, Sonic the Hedgehog's objective is clear here right now. He wants to move, but the player is a tyrant and they're not pushing buttons on the controller. And so therefore, we don't just learn something about Sonic the Hedgehog's personality because of that idle animation, because look at him, he's a nice, fun guy. He's like, all oh, his buddies are smiling or whatever. But also um, that animation starts to express something about Sonic and his actual relationship to us and players. Um, which is to say, you know, Arthur Morgan goes into, into town and he shoots like 50 people because the player's like, I'm just gonna be rootin' tootin' and shootin'. Um, but then when they stop, um, Arthur uh, shakes out his hand when he's on his horse. Um, that moment is beautiful to me. Um, it's the moment where Arthur gets to exhale finally after being controlled. Um, sometimes Arthur Morgan will pet his horse and in, in these moments we can ask us uh, like questions like what does Arthur Morgan value? But we should also be asking what does Arthur do and what does he value before the player asserts control over him as an actor? Those are the things I want to see when I return to Arthur um, because small moments aren't. Um, these people, these entities are being controlled constantly by players, by tyrannical people. And so the moments where they get to even express a tiny moment of themselves, even though those things are being crafted by us, um, are important. This can happen in gameplay too. Here, Mario is skidding. This is not just about game feel. It's not just about having good platforming mechanics. This is a moment where I'm reminded that like Mario is a person in a place with weight and validity. And that's really, really cool. Tracer is reloading her guns. Oh, wow. How flashy. Those blizzard animations are really great, aren't they, Lana? Um, but also like you can, you can kind of cancel this animation by hitting like melee. But otherwise, I will suggest to you that this is a moment where Tracer is free. Good news, even better news, you can bake some sort of, uh, some of this knowledge into your mechanics. So Arthur values his horse a lot, but we get a chance to pet Arthur's horse too, because if Arthur values it, we should probably give players a chance to value those things too. If Arthur values it enough to do it by himself, bridge that gap and allow your players to do it with Arthur because empathy is key. You need to be treating the people that you're animating as people. I keep on saying people because I mean it. These are entities. Um, and if you start to find the moments in your games where people can um, break away, that's great. There are exceptions to this, like digital worlds are a huge exception because the bodies that we inhabit in digital worlds tend to be a little bit more like extensions of our limbs. So we get to sort of define the poses and idle animations in there, but otherwise, find the moments where your characters can break free from player tyranny and emphasize them. Um, you won't just have moments where your characters find relief, your players will find relief with your characters and your games will be kinder. And I think that's something we all need right now in this world, it's just a little bit of kindness. So uh, there you go. Howdy everybody, my name is Brandon Nason and I'm a 3D animator currently working at Pocket Jams, a mobile gaming company based here in the city. It's about three blocks that way. After nearly three years of development, we recently released our newest uh, title, Wild Beyond, late last year, and I'm now assisting with the creation of new assets for the live product. So by profession, I'm an animator, but I'm also a landscape photographer. I'm a Spartan racer, I'm a leader of a nearly undefeated escape room group, and I'm a very lucky boyfriend. Now, you're probably asking yourself, why is this guy up here sharing these personal details with you at a game that's, or a talk that's supposed to be about game development? Because of, I believe that having a robust and enriching personal life outside the walls of the studio can help you be a better game developer and artist. 
I believe that our industry always has had this problem, finding the proper work-life balance for its developers, and I'm up here today to make the case of why it's absolutely vital that we keep this relevant in our community. I honestly believe there's a little bit of a sickness within our community where having a personal life is at best seen as a nice perk and at the very worst, a weakness. There are vast creative and emotional benefits for, uh, for balancing personal and professional priorities, and I would like to go over a few of those with you today. I think that we often get a little wrapped up in finding reference and tree animation a little bit too cerebrally sometimes. We count frames, we analyze spacing, and we make these really embarrassing uh, reference videos, uh, and we try our damnedest to get these massive tangles of sine waves to somehow create life. But animators are also actors. Need to animate a character falling in love? Yeah, of course you can find a reference video on YouTube about, of somebody falling in love, but how much more well-informed would your decisions and acting choices be if you'd actually gone through that experience? I believe that living boldly and seeking out uh, new experiences will help you develop a creative catalog that you can draw upon while animating. It also works for the physical realm. Does a character need to rock climb? Again, you can find video reference of the physical mechanics of that, but if you go rock climbing yourself and experience the adrenaline rush and the muscle fatigue when you get up to the top of the wall and you look down, you'll be able to animate with far more fidelity. You'll feel it. I'm, I run Spartan races with my friends for fun, and I can't tell you how well that's informed my understanding of the physical, physicality of body movement and weight. Have you guys ever jumped over a fire, climbed a rope, thrown a spear? Those are experiences that you'll never forget and help me each and every time I animate. Now, why is that important? I believe that knowledge gained uh, from real world experiences like these can elevate your animation from something that is merely functional to something truly artistic and nuanced. Uh, that type of knowledge cannot be gained from sitting in front of your computer stuck in the office crunching to meet a deadline. So let's take a moment to talk about the emotional and, uh, benefits and uh, prioritizing your personal life. A animate, so animating professionally can be grueling. As amazing as fulfilling as a career in animation can be, it often comes with a price. We've all heard the horror stories, the rumors, even the news reports, especially over the last couple of years. Endless crunch, low pay, living contact to contract with no stability and enormous economic anxiety, substance abuse, even divorce. If you aren't personally experiencing these aspects of our industry, you assuredly know somebody who has. Our passion drives us to work hard, sometimes with such force and fervor that we, a burnout is inevitable. For the record, I consider myself extremely fortunate to have found a company that values the employees enough to make work-life balance a priority. I know, however, that I'm the minority on this issue. But th for those of you who are, have to deal with some, if not all, of the problems I listed, I, I would highly recommend putting the time and effort into cultivating your friendships. I mean, just being able to go home in a rage when things aren't going well at work, to commiserate and even problem solve with people that love and care about your personal well-being is extremely important, especially during times like crunch. I know I've had to experience that from time to time. When you're sitting in front of the, the, that monitor, bleary-eyed from lack of sleep, eyes shifting up to the clock on the wall, dreading that looming deadline, just knowing that there are, you're not alone in the world and that there are people out there that believe in you can uh, be the proverbial thing that keeps you afloat. Both creativity and passion are not ever-flowing springs. They're more like buckets. Push too hard and for too long, and those buckets can empty or even start to develop holes. It's important to have the self-knowledge that allows you to know what refills those creative reservoirs and to give yourself enough time for you to fill the, them back up outside of work. For me, planning on going on adventures gives me something to look, to look forward to, which is always nice. Traveling the world and seeing new places with friends and loved ones leaves me refreshed and ready to get back to work. It can be different for everybody, but I challenge you to go and find your passion, find your inspiration, and give yourself the time to enjoy it. Being emotionally and creatively healthy makes you a better animator and an employee. Who's gonna do a better job? The walking zombie of a human being, sleep deprived and burned out, or a well-rested animator fresh off a weekend spent doing what they love with friends and family? Creativity requires inspiration, epiphany, and hard work. It also requires the state of mind to be receptive to those things. Remember that at the end of the day, in spite of all the various programs we interface with and the professional obstacles that we must navigate, we are artists first and foremost, and as such, we thrive off inspiration and personal experiences just like any other artistic discipline. Know too that we are all only human and that we need some recovery time and the solidarity of friends and family uh, to get us through the tough times. Each and every one of us only has this one life to live. Jobs will come and go, your work will ebb and flow, but your personal relationships and emotional and creative health last forever. So get out there, make friends, call your mom, experience life, and above all else, make sure you take care of yourself. You'll only be a better artist and game developer if you do. Thank you. I call my mom, she's gonna like that. <laughs> All right, I was told to put this under my chin. Is that working? Hi, my name's Gwen. 
<laughs> I love this room. My name is Gwen. I'm an animator. I'm an indie developer. And the theme of this talk this year is creative voice. So let's talk about how to be creative. Let's talk about how do you actually be creative. Science has already figured this out, thankfully. It <laughs> turns out that the way you be more creative is to have constraints. It turns out that having limited resources forces your brain to work different and will actually make you more creative, which is good because we have a lot of constraints in this industry. We have constraints on bone counts, on frame counts, on all sorts of things. These talks are ridiculous. I have constraints for this talk, right? I have 20 slides. The talk auto advances after 16 seconds on each slide. I have to work within these ridiculous technical constraints. And I have other things too, right? Like I've got constraints on my tone. Because I give this talk, I've given it several times, and every year I do like kind of maybe a quirky, funny sort of talk. So now I've got an audience built up, and they expect me to do a talk like that. And if I do something different, my audience will be mad about, well, they just won't like it as much. And then I have this other audience, which is people in this room, right? Like, look around. Everybody here is an animator. You want to hear about animation. You don't want to hear about like my book club or Lana's haircut or design or comedy. You want to hear about animation. It's why you're here, right? So I have to figure out what you guys want, which is easy, because you fill out evaluations every year. You fill out those, those evaluation forms, right? And what you guys like is any time you have a takeaway, technical talks, things where you have something that you can take back to your studio and use, right? We know this. You fill out the forms and tell us this. But in spite of this, every year, Lana, the person who runs this, says, no, 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 not for the micro talks. This is different. This is going to be about culture. It's going to be about feelings, right? <laughs> This is how we end the day. We're gonna do something cathartic. We're gonna inspire people. We're gonna, you know, like do something really different. My creative director is a whack job who has a different idea for what this should be than the market, which is also different from what, honestly, like what I care about. If you really break it down and you look at what I care about, all I care about is this. This is my indie game. I spent my nights and weekends working on it. I quit my job at the end of last year and I got it funded. I've, uh, it's going extremely well. I've spun up a small team. I'm bringing the game here. I'm showcasing this game that I've been working on for years in the Expo Hall this year at GDC. And I'm over the moon about it. It's all I think about, right? This is my baby. But it's not what you want to hear about. You don't want somebody standing on stage marketing at you. I know that. What I care about, what's most important to me, and sometimes you're going to experience this in your career, the thing that's most important to you isn't necessarily what your audience wants or what your creative director wants. A lot of times you're being pulled in a lot of different directions and it's difficult to marry them all, right? Like let's, again, just take a look at this talk. Like this talk has to be a little bit funny. It's gotta be about culture. It's gotta be about animation so that you guys are happy. It has to be about kind so that I'm happy. <laughs> and a little bit it's gotta be about peanut butter. And I know that's gonna be sound unusual, but I've got financial constraints and I just need you to bear with me here, all right? Because I don't have a lot of money and I got this contract to promote peanut butter, and I don't really need the contract, but if I don't take this contract this year, then I won't have one next year, and I might really need that contract next year. And so I don't really have a lot of time to do this other stuff with the peanut butter, but I'm gonna jam it in anyway. And why not? Because <laughs> peanut butter is great. Like, there's nothing wrong with peanut butter. I don't feel like a sellout by promoting peanut butter. I don't think that diminishes this talk at all. Peanut butter is delicious. I would have probably put the peanut butter stuff in here anyway. So anyway, <laughs> if we're getting back to it, this talk is gonna be a little bit funny. It's gonna be about culture. It's gonna be about animation, it's gonna be about kind, and it's gonna be a little bit about peanut butter, which is fun. <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> this is kind. It features a lot of animation smears. So if you look here, you'll see I'm going forward, and then when I undo, the smears are even more exaggerated. I'm gonna do it again right here. I'm gonna move forward, and you see like kind of a smear, and when I undo, you'll see it really exaggerated. The way I achieve this is I create several cylinders. Um, and I, I sketch <laughs> traditional 2D smear frames on these cylinders. Uh, these cylinders are bound between two bones that I can kind of pull apart or orient how I need to in order to make the, a certain kind of a shape. Um, when I start the effect, I spawn a cylinder. And the cylinder I choose is, uh, basically I have to create a series of these for the ends of each character, the extremities, and for the body. I create three cylinders for each one for the three different directions it could be pulling in. So here we're looking at the cylinders for the T shape. Um, and in engine, I basically spawn this effect, which spawns a cylinder. I, <laughs> you see it? I, I leave one bone <laughs> in world space and I have the other bone attached to the end of the extremity. I also have a couple bones in the middle that it will push out sometimes if I need to make an arc like this. So that's the talk. And it had some constraints, all right, it did. But I mean, did it that, those constraints make the talk better? 
I don't know. They made it more creative, though. I think we can all agree that the <laughs> science is right. That talk was more creative because of it. And I think that's a good thing. So if you're ever pulled, if you feel like you're being pulled in a lot of different directions by your director and different people at your studio, embrace that. That's a good thing. That's going to make you more creative in the end. My name's Gwen. Uh, the game I'm showcasing this year is Kind. You can play it on the expo floor later. I hope you enjoy the nut butters and the rest of your day. Cheers. Hello, my name is John Paul Reimler. I have been in the industry for about 10 years. I'm an animation specialist at Vicarious Visions. Um, and I've been a lead on eight projects since I've been there, almost the whole time actually, which is kind of hard to believe. But it should advance and it won't. <clears throat> before that, I had some experiences at Rhythm and Hughes as an animation lead. And before that, I was in the military for eight years and had some opportunities to lead there as well. So why am I telling you this? Why, why does this even matter? Why should you listen? Well, what I'm saying here is that although I'm an animator, I've spent lots of my career as a manager as well. Some of you in here may have had completely different experiences, and I don't want to act like I know all of them. Uh, so this is from my perspective with some of my experiences. So I've struggled ever since I became a lead to find a balance of creating animation content while helping foster creative direction within my teams. So what's the problem with that? Well. Because <laughs> animation is all I know and care about. And this is what got me here. So I need to be good at this. Uh, I need to keep doing this. This is all I have, right? With that mindset, though, comes its own set of challenges. Because I have always been focused as an animator with some leading involved. It's like I have two pieces of my brain kind of fighting over each other constantly in battle to save the hearts and minds of I'm not really sure where I was going with that, but oh yeah, that's right, my animator brain, my animator brain, that's right. So I don't always have uh, time to take on the shots that I want, so I take on some shit shots some of the time so my team can stay passionate. Games already operate on tight time, uh, schedules, it's hard to take those animations to polish, now tack on the duties of being a lead, I just need to animate, boy, I suck. I still need to manage the team with its own responsibilities and the project with its own responsibilities, like tracking assets, career advancements, pipeline issues, outsourcing art directors, lots to think about and use energy towards, but you all know how much energy goes into a single performance or a complex biomechanics. There's so much new stuff to think about, all this added responsibility that was rewarding in a sense, but also a bit tense since the same old question kept creeping in. I need to animate, right? To be a successful lead, I realized that I needed to reach out. I needed to find this new brand of creativity that would empower my role as a lead rather than distract from it. I started to think back on all the areas I had the privilege of being creative and having impact as a lead. Working with narrative and art leadership to help shape who these characters were in our games through brainstorms, revisions, concepting, figuring out new ways to tell stories in games, maybe sometimes the same story. This allowed me to challenge my own knowledge of what I thought storytelling was. I thought about how my direction was impacting animation quality. It wasn't just about holding myself accountable anymore. Understanding how different animators work and learning from them. I had to learn how to manage them differently to get the best team results in the end. Learning how to give the best feedback for the, that individual helped me understand better and more precise ways to give feedback. And funny enough, it, it actually helped me understand the type of feedback uh, that, I, that helped me too. I didn't stop becoming an animator just because I was a lead. I needed to rely on them just as much. Driving how to communicate story through this process at an early stage and sell the idea honestly felt like this creative break. I would get more excited about this phase sometimes uh, and it taught me a lot about myself as an artist and surprisingly something I was passionate about outside of animation. I've stopped thinking about all the problems. I've stopped thinking just as an animator and now a lead, but more importantly as a game dev. I learned to, how to contribute to many areas of game development and not just animation. And I also learned how this can influence animation at my studio as we develop games. I learned to grow leadership on the team. Training and mentoring new leads is important for the health of your department and your team. And some people want the opportunity 
And being able to provide that support helps foster an environment where people can challenge themselves as well. And yes, growing leads and leaders on your team will allow me and you possibly to still be animating content. I have stayed strong against production and told them that I will never give up taking shots, but I'll take on shots sometimes that aren't as intense on the workload, opening up space for my team to stay passionate and engage, and the struggle continues to be very real. I am still working on the right balance because just like me, it has evolved. I know now that I will be creative and I will have a voice. It's just up to me to help define what that balance looks like. And now with all of that out of the way, I can get back to making really important decisions. Like on Fridays, it's donut and bagel day. So which one am I gonna choose? <laughs> Finding your creative voice in what we do comes with challenges and struggles and that's okay. I don't know which way to go all the time, but as I look out at how I contribute to the creative process of being a game dev, it has become clear to me that leading, like animating, is what you make of it. The choice to find your voice in all of this is what has empowered me to be creative. Thank you for listening. I'm John Paul Ryan Miller, an animation specialist at Vicarious Visions. You can link up with me on Twitter or all week at GDC. Let's hope this plays. <laughs> so my name is Akita Taranduke. Uh, I've been animating for five years. Uh, four of those years have been in mobile games. And more recently, my first year in PC console uh, in January of this year. Um, and I currently live in, reside in Orange County, California. And I work at Nexon OC, so. Okay, this thing doesn't wanna play. Okay, I guess it's playing. <laughs> so, uh, what did I learn about my, uh, during my journey? I learned that I have a lot of problems, as you can tell. First of all, I wanted to grow, but I didn't really know where to begin. Am I considered a good animator now that I have a job in the industry? I really have no idea. But early on, I was struggling to make a connection with my job subject matter. Uh, initially, everything was exciting. I was just happy to have a job and be doing animation. Uh, but over time, I got complacent and I began to lose my motivation. Plus, my traditional approach to animation of diving right in without planning or researching at all wasn't really working for me. So I, I was really passionate, but it left me anxious. And I had to figure out a way to solve all these problems, but still make it an enjoyable experience for myself. So let's talk about growth. Uh, it's hard to push yourself, right? So settling on your surface ideas may leave you bored and be reflected in your work, and you don't want that. So embrace being a nerd. Being a nerd lets you dive deeper into your research and help you, help you find your voice as an artist. For me, being a freak encyclopedia of random facts and knowledge gave me the confidence behind my artistic decisions and opinions. There's a reason why they call them growing pains. Finding your confidence can be a challenge for some, so maybe all you have to do is change your perspective. Speaking of perspective, I worked on Marvel's Avengers Academy, a mobile game. I am not into Marvel comic books. I know, please don't hate me, but I do have a healthy obsession with mythology and folklore. And by reframing Marvel, uh, Marvel as a modern day mythos, I was able to take a look at character progression like Thor, or characters like Thor, and take note of how his personality change over time. Just as an example, a Shakespearean actor that we all know and love, uh, from inspired by classic mythology in the first film to the more goofy and awkward badass of the, by the end of the third film. I wanna talk about passion really quick. Have you ever seen a shot that you could feel the animator was having fun with it? Well, my friend Lindsay Lidecker animated this shot and she's incredibly funny and naturally animated. I think that she was very successful with this animation by establishing a personal connection with the character, which led to other artists being inspired by her idea and creating art on their own. So if you can make a personal connection with your character, you can make anything they do interesting, right? Be it running around with a cardboard box in your head, playing with a soccer ball, or simply sitting down in a chair. However, it's not enough to just be passionate. I like to jump in and start doing things, but 
that would often lead to frustration. And that was just simply because I just didn't have enough information. However, I discovered that YouTube has plenty of information, including summaries that I could listen to without having to read the entire Marvel omnibus. I was on, I was on tight deadlines and I had, a, a, I had a really tight schedule, so I had to make do with what I had. In the case of Moon Girl and Devil Dino, I had no idea who either of these characters were. All they had to go off were visuals, which often depict the Devil Dino as just a crazy dinosaur. But getting to know the relationship helped me focus on his playful puppy attitude instead. And Devil Dino had more to him than being just another angry dinosaur. Even with all these strategies in full swing, researching was still a pain. I love comedy and working on Family Guy's quest for stuff, but I learned I wasn't very good at comedy. With a suggestion of my peers, I went straight to the source and watched as much Family Guy as my brain could handle. So like all of Family Guy. Uh, I began to get a better understanding of the show's style and really figured out where the connect, uh, characters were coming from. This also caused me to have a more of a snowball effect and I started, ended up studying comedic uh, icons like Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin on my own. Turns out I was having fun. And I used the same approach when tasked, these dan uh, tasked with dance anima animations. I'm naturally a horrible dancer, so I got tasked with all the dance animations. And it turns out that studying the complicated mechanics of body uh, of dance was actually an enjoyable experience for me. So let's recap this mess. Uh, researching, first of all, helps you grow as an artist without noticing it. Fake it till all you make it only makes, gets you so far. And I couldn't just keep firing from the hip. I had to learn to be invested with my research, which grew my confidence as an artist and an animator. Finding the interest in assignments is going to be your responsibility. Shift your perspective, perspective until you can make that connection. And the more you know about what you're animating, the more informed your decisions will be in the end. And finally, use creative ways to make research and study fun for yourself. If you're frustrated and it feels like a chore, try a different approach. Instead of, form, instead of treating it as a formality, treat research as an opportunity and learn something new. Researching ultimately is your friend and a powerful tool in helping you find your artistic voice. My name is Nikita Taranduk. You can email me at nikitataranduk at dmail.com. Find me on Twitter at Nikita Taranduk. Thank you very much. Oh, God. Hey, my name is Nikki Roth. I'm a tech animator at Google, and I'm here to talk about confidence with confidence. <laughs> All right. So let me tell you a little bit about my first career in gymnastics. I grew up as a competitive gymnast, and as a gymnast, you are literally judged on your confidence and ability to execute skills. There was this one skill, the full twisting side gainer. I remember spending an entire summer training this beam dismount. I practiced it and practiced it until I felt confident I could perform it under pressure. You can imagine how nerve wracking it is to throw yourself backwards and upside down on a four inch piece of wood. Beam was not my favorite event. It was more of a mind game, but it was time to debut this skill. So at the next meet, my coach gave me her pep talk. She told me I could do this, she reminded me how many times I've done this before. And she went over the 10 different things I should focus on. But what really mattered was that she and my teammates were there cheering me on. I went through my own rituals, the internal monologue. All right, Nikki, you got this. The drills that were now mantras, lift, set, wrap, and all the ridiculous mind melding it took for me to believe I could do this. As gymnasts, we are taught to stand and walk with attitude. So I strutted to the beam, I saluted, took a deep breath, and began the routine. The moment came, lift, set, wrap, and I nailed it. The connection, the form, call me biased, but it was solid. And when we gymnasts stick a landing, we salute not with one, but with both arms. If you break down a gymnastics routine into frames like an animation, it's all about posing. Strong lines, silhouettes. In a single pose, we can recognize confidence. In a single pose, we can read misery or mastery. So if we frame this on my current career, which is basically digital gymnastics, I am still being judged on my confidence to execute skill. 
And it's not easy. It takes practice, courage, and it really helps to have support. I want to help my team do great things, but I need to show what I can offer. I need to own what I can do and own what I can't. For me, I struggled with owning it. It's hard to walk into a room with confidence when you're not sure you have what it takes to be there. Imposter syndrome is real. Like gymnastics or anything else, it's more of a mind game. You are there because you put in the time. You are there because you want to be. So be there. Sit at the table, literally sit at the table. You belong there. Be present and engaged. Listen thoughtfully. But don't just listen. Form your own opinions. Your perspective and your experience is so unique that you, and only you, can bring it to the table. But don't just bring it. Share your thoughts. Say them and say them with conviction. Speak up, ask questions, amplify your voice, and be part of the conversation. We can read body language, but we can't read minds. I used to be a chronic mumbler. I was constantly having to repeat myself. I would be interrupted or talked over. But when you come from a place of passion, you will energize the room. If you are authentic in what you have to say, others will care. If you are transparent and show empathy, others will appreciate what you choose to share. On the other hand, speaking up does not mean being the loudest or talking the most. Speaking up is about sharing your voice and sharing the floor. By including others around you, you can create a dialogue and a space for everyone. We all have different personality types. We digest information differently, express ourselves differently. Not everyone prefers speaking in front of large crowds. It makes us feel vulnerable. When you are considerate of this, when you empower others, it empowers you. It builds a network of support and trust that will absolutely help to build your confidence. And allies can give you the courage to speak up when you need to the most. So it's time to debut your skills. Confidence comes with training, courage, and support. I encourage you to practice sharing and share what you practice. Trust it, own it, and when you nail it, salute with both arms. <laughs>
started on your second game without much introduction. You carve your niche among an institutional dysfunction. From step to block to polished blinds, you've redone this whole shot ten times because your director's never heard of pre production. You scrub along a life's timeline where others pitch, we rolled. We eased out from a life of cycles, loops, and holes. A normal life, it has a bad for us, it has a spline. We chose to live our lives this way, one keyframe at a time. You get a corporate job, and now you're making better pay. My annual reviews and a 401k. But now you fantasize about an indie legacy. Your game a work of art made with love and gets lost in steam and you'll have to file for bankruptcy. But corporate hours are no surprise. At six months out, you've worked all night. You'd think it'd be more organized with 15 games in this franchise. you shipped a few titles. Now you've done this for some years. And there are options for you to grow. None of them are here. Do you Compromise work in life to not displace your man or wife or sacrifice stability to further your career. You put your heart and soul in it, you're driven to succeed. It's a decade down the line, you graduate to leave. Now you've got your spreadsheet so tight, you forget what Maya looks like and spend your days in twice as many meetings. Scrub along life's timeline Where others pitch we roll We chase mastery of an art Instead of chasing gold A normal life, it has a path For us, it has a spline We chose to live our lives this way One keyframe at a time And now you're looking back Over your successful career You've gotten some good and bad credits over the years. But it's a fight to stay relevant. Is there such thing as retirement? In a couple decades, will there still be room for me here? We, we, we slug along life's timeline where others pitch we rolled. And you can feel the frame rate change as we grow tired and old. A normal life, it has a path. For us, it has a spline. We chose to live our lives this way, one keyframe at a time. We scrub along life's timeline. We keep our layers clean. Because we can undo or load up a fresh scene. A normal life, it has a path, for us it has a spline. We chose to live our lives this way, one keyframe at a time. We chose to live our lives this way, one keyframe at a time. We chose to live our lives this way, one keyframe at a time.